Andrew McKellar, welcome back. You have pointed out elsewhere today that your rough estimate of the cost of this wage increase is just under $8 billion, but this in an economy that does have profitable corporations and which is running pretty hot at the moment. Why is that not affordable for many employers? Well, I think what we've got to look at is an evolving situation uh, for business. Uh, at the moment, business is facing uh, one of the most severe labour and skills uh, shortages in nearly 50 years, uh, intense supply chain disruption. Uh, we've got energy prices uh, spiking through the roof. Uh, there's a lot of pressure out there. And for many businesses uh, who've just come through two years of pandemic, uh, trying to maintain employment, trying to get back on their feet, this kind of additional cost impost at this time uh, it can be very damaging. But this only picks up people at the lower end. Mm. By your own description of a tight labour market, it would be the reality uh, for many above those that they're already paying rates of growth higher than 5%, are they? So then the question becomes, how could sweeping up a few hundred thousand at the bottom, mm. uh, that's the minimum mm. uh, award component, possibly hurt the bottom line? Well, look, I don't think there's any great argument about the, the genuine you know, minimum uh, award wage or minimum wage, I should say. Uh, it's when it cascades into the modern award system. So those who are you know, on the lowest uh, paid levels, about 180,000 people, yep. I think that's one thing. Um, but this decision then cascades back into about 2.6 million other employees who are in the award system, and that's certainly adding cost to a lot of businesses, rather than giving them the opportunity to come to flexible arrangements based on their actual market conditions. All right. Now, there's two questions that arise from that. One is, did you specifically draw a hard line between minimum wage and award system in your submission? And the other is, what are the longer term fixes to modern awards that you're seeking? Well, I think it's, it's, it's always been an issue that, that we need to make that distinction. And if you look now internationally, Australia has one of the highest uh, minimum wages uh, anywhere in the world, possibly after this decision, even the highest. So that's, that, I think, is uh, you know, something that needs to be looked at in terms of international uh, competitiveness. Going forward, though, uh, we do need to have um, real reforms uh, on the agenda. We need to make our industrial relations system work more flexibly. Things like enterprise bargaining at the moment, they are withering on the vine, and we have to find a way uh, to make that much more attractive again particularly for medium-sized enterprises. Right. So in that sense, you're on a unity ticket with Sally McManus, but you're coming at it from completely opposite perspectives, aren't well, you? Is there, a, is there a meeting in the middle to be had here on changes to a system which hasn't delivered wage rises for many of any great consequence well, for years now. Yeah, I mean, it would be wonderful to think that we could get some agreement and some real reform. And ultimately, if we're going to get that, there is going to have to be some level of consensus uh, achieved. So, look, I think we're, we're here to talk constructively uh, about how that might work. Uh, I think uh, we've seen proposals in the past uh, and I think we'll need to see the union movement move a little bit further than what they've uh, suggested uh, in previous occasions. I mean, one forum in which you could have this conversation is the summit, mm. the employment mm. summit, full employment summit that mm. the new government is going to convene. But if this national wage case is any example, you, you start from polar extremes. On the numbers, you came in at two and a half percent, the trade union movement double. Uh, is there room for reconciliation here for the majority of Australian workers, many of whom aren't even affected by it? Well, I, well, I mean, to clarify, we, we were proposing an increase of 3%, um, yeah. which, which in fact is the highest increase that we'd put forward you know, since the new Act came into place in sure. 2009. So, look, I think, you know, let's, uh, let's not misrepresent the, the position here. Business employers uh, are saying that a, a pay rise is justified, but we do have to be careful about the broader economic circumstances. We don't want to feed into the inflationary pressures that are already very present in the economy. We've seen the Reserve Bank saying that that is going to increase, uh, not decrease. Uh, so I think we've just got to be very careful to be uh, economically responsible. And if those forecasts from the Reserve Bank Governor come to pass, many expect they will and will be reflected mm -hmm. 
in the federal budget, where's that going to leave mm. business beyond mm. Christmas? Well, I think business and also households. And I think one of the things that the risks here we've seen, I mean, the Reserve Bank is already foreshadowing that it will increase uh, interest rates uh, further. Uh, the market is pricing in uh, something above 2.5% uh, by um, sometime next year. So we, what we don't want to see is a situation where uh, workers are getting a pay rise. That's getting chewed up by uh, higher prices and higher interest rates. Uh, business is just facing higher costs and lower product uh, profitability. Uh, that, that doesn't make any sense. Right, but the end of that story or that narrative you just outlined is workers are still behind, aren't they? Even, even on today's uh, uh, decision at 5 point two percent and inflation at seven come Christmas they're they're even further behind well we we don't get further in front by pushing inflation higher and higher and the the the, the issue here the the economic solution here is we've got to uh, relieve those pressures on the supply side uh, take the pressure off prices so that inflation is not going up at five or six or seven percent uh, per annum we've got to get back into that two to three percent target range that the reserve banks signal if we don't do that then living standards will be going backwards for a long time to come. OK, and three specific sectors have just been mm. pushed down the road a little, tourism, aviation and hospitality. Uh, will they be ready, uh, under your assessment, to meet their higher wages expectations come October? Fully recovered, in other words? Look, I think there are a lot of challenges in those sectors and in our own submission. Uh, we did call out those uh, sectors uh, to say that a delay uh, in any decision uh, would be justified. So, look, I think you've got to recognise that those are the areas where the impact of the COVID pandemic was the greatest. In many cases, they were shut down, they were affected by lock, uh, lockdowns, by border closures. Uh, they're just getting back up on their feet and I think it's important to give them as much breathing space as possible. Not a great time to be a forecaster, maybe not to be a, a business boss or a trade union representative. There's so many moving parts. But Andrew McKellar, uh, thanks for your thoughts on this one today. Great. Thanks very much, Greg.